Okay, hello everybody. Welcome to Saya Banjet. Uh, right now I have uh, Curtis J. Jones with me. He is one of uh, the greatest band of practitioners I know. And also he has a, an incredible uh, background in security, in national security. So I uh, will be translating everything, everything he said uh, as we start chatting. So uh, my English is not the best. But I will do my best. So thank you, Sayaki, to, to, to have me. Uh, it's, uh, it's amazing to have the opportunity to talk to you again. No, no problem. Enjoy it. Thank you. Okay, uh, well, so my first question would be, uh, can you tell us a little bit of your background in Bando and in your job in general? Well, uh, I've been practicing Bando since the 90s. Uh, so that'd be about 30 years. Uh, I started in 40, 45 years. I know that you have a, an amazing background in security. As I told you before, I, there is a picture of you with the ex-CIA director, and also you had a, the opportunity to work in, in the Middle East. So can you tell us a little bit of that? And also, if Bando uh, helped you doing that, or, well, tell us the story, the whole story. Uh, originally, my security, I uh, was a law enforcement officer for chief of police, uh, prior to getting into uh, nuclear security, where I was part of a uh, protective force for the government uh, protecting weapons grade uh, uranium uh, from the bombs. So, uh, a lot of training, a lot of high and skilled personnel, uh, of course, high level security clearances. And I did that for about 17 years. And, uh, I got injured and I had to go back to law enforcement and teach them that I could no longer pass the requirements to maintain that position. It was, it was like being on a squad team or being on a SEAL team. Uh, although it was paramilitary, it was a very, very highly skilled group of uh, ex-military and law enforcement officers. But can you tell us a little bit of a General Petraeus and your relationship and how you to meet or whatever? Yeah. Well, uh, General Petraeus and uh, General Casey were the head of the uh, armed forces in Iraq and Afghanistan. And they were leapfrogged. Say, Casey would go to Afghanistan for a year or two years, I think it was two years, and then they flip flop and uh, Petraeus would come in. Uh, you had to be at least a Third uh, brigadier or major general uh, to be work at that. Uh, Trey, this is when I met him, was a fourth, fourth uh, force guard, fourth, fourth general. Uh, originally, well, Casey was there. They both worked in uh, at the uh, joint military group there and uh, command staff. So, um, Trey is after he from the military, and he had a glorious career. Uh, he was recruited by the Obama administration to take over the CIA, which he did for several years. Okay, uh, so also I would like you to tell us a little bit of the background of some of the most known martial artists in, within, in, inside Bando. Like, for example, I remember that you mentioned uh, Bob Maxwell, a uh, Secret Service uh, agent, ex-Secret Service, and also I know that there are some other agents or government officials within the Bando organizations. Yeah, Bando has several high-level uh, government officials or foreign government officials that are part of the Bando organization. Uh, Bando has about 
Cook, who was a deputy sheriff and a training officer for uh, the Franklin County Sheriff's Department, which was a capital. Uh, uh, so it was the largest one in the state of Ohio. So very highly trained, very, uh, very skilled uh, personnel there. And well, uh, the reason of this is because uh, Bando tends to, to help the military and the special forces, the law enforcement and all, right? right? We, uh, Bando, uh, of course, is well over a thousand years old, uh, and the practitioners uh, developed the system in Southeast Asia from the Chinese, and there's a lot of Kung Fu influence on the system. Uh, in World War II, during the uh, China Burma theater, the Japanese had invaded Burma, and Indian in Burma had a group of jungle warfare fighters, and their name was the Gurkhas. And uh, later, because of their fighting spirit, the British Special Forces has adopted them into the British military. So it's a great honor. Uh, to be a Gurkha and also to serve on the uh, British Special Forces. Uh, Dr. G's family and uncles all served uh, in the military and as parts of the government there. Uh, Merrill's Marauders uh, in the 1940s freed Burma from Japanese occupation. And Dr. G brought the system to America and taught it to honor war veterans and uh, first responders. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Uh, also, I remember we were uh, discussing yesterday about the use of fire weapons within Bando and also in your experience. So can you tell us a little bit of that, the history behind that? Well, originally, uh, when Bando was brought to the United States by Dr. G, uh, he worked with the uh, Washington University in the American University in Washington, D.C. Uh, he was a linguist. Uh, of he speaks as, as many as seven different languages. He writes in five that I know of. Uh, and he started training personnel in Washington and the Baltimore area in the early, late 1950s, early 60s. So that's where our father was established first in the United States. Uh, firearms, of course, was part of a combat system for soldiers, military, and law enforcement. So that, at one point, had been part of the training. Uh, past 20 years, we've gotten away from firearms training because it's so easily uh, prolific within communities of America. Everybody has a firearm. A lot of people train themselves. A lot of people uh, go to training to be concealed culture classes and uh, that was the found as far as firearms. I should ask because your resume is so amazing. Can you tell us maybe one or two of the things that you would like highlight of, on your history as a, a government official? Well, um, <laughs> most of my adult life has been in security and law enforcement and training. Of course, I've trained martial arts and I'm a police academy commander and trainer in the state of Ohio for many years. I've taught college, uh, I've taught secondary school as well. And uh, when the war in Iraq broke out, there was a need for law enforcement and military personnel who could train Iraqi military. And uh, in my civilian life, I've trained many SEALs and forces. That the joint military bonded practitioners or the vet thought out actually training after they uh, retired from the military. So uh, I was more or less recruited uh, to work at the Department of Justice under contract with ISITAP. ISITAP is the International Civilian Police Training Teams. And they their personnel who have expertise such as myself, we go all over the world under that organization and train democratic police throughout the world. Uh, I remember that you said something very interesting yesterday about how I Iraqis uh, believe some of the things we watch on, on movies and they expect something like that. 
So, uh, can you tell us a little bit of that, please? Well, uh, in third world countries, people don't have access uh, to information. Uh, one of the basic parts of warfare is the spread and access to information. Information and disinformation are critical children in warfare. And it's used, has been used for, for centuries. Uh, a lot of the Nazi people, they don't have a lot of education. The uh, majority of them are just uh, villagers who, who work with black dogs and make ends meet. Not everyone behind uh, the tree in our act or Afghanistan is a terrorist. In fact, jewelry, the vast majority are just hardworking. Okay, also I remember that we discussed a little bit about psychological uh, combat and all the PTSD and all that uh, subject in general. Can you tell us about your experience with that and also, uh, well, anything on that subject, please? Well, uh, there's different parts of warfare that are uh, deployed in any given situation. Uh, psychological warfare is certainly one of them. Uh, one of the th things I have learned from having spent nearly four years in the Middle East in a combat zone was that very few people come back unscathed. Uh, everybody who is exposed to combat, not just being in theater, a lot of people were in theater, they never left the base, they never, they never saw combat. But anyone who was uh, working in the military or, or some of these uh, government contracting agencies uh, who engaged in actual combat, whether it be hand-to-hand, -hand, door door-to-door, uh, in public mission, uh, you know, they're going to have some high stress level. Uh, they're going to have some traumatic stress as a police officer. Uh, uh, We are exposed to a lot of violence and uh, death and uh, horrible things that happen through domestic violence, car accidents, fires, shootings, um, violent homicides. So as a police officer, you're exposed to a lot more of that. And the military, the majority of the military personnel are just young men. They're 18 years old, 19, 20, 21. They join the military, either try and get an education, uh, have a career choice, and, and come out and get a job. So they're just boys, really, and young ladies. And when they're exposed uh, to an ambush, half their squad is killed, and, uh, you know, it's going to traumatize them lives. Myself, I see several horrible things, and uh, it took me about two years to decompress from some of the things that, that I had seen. And, uh, and I've been through a lot before I ever went to the war zone. So it, it's, uh, it's, it's a traumatic experience. So for how long uh, were you active? Uh, and when did you decide to, to, to quit or to retire? Well, uh, I started uh, working for the government and as a contractor in early 2005. I was recruited because of my teaching uh, experience uh, to the advanced uh, to police training at the Adnan Palace, which was inside the Green Zone. Uh, because of my security background, I did the election training for the first democratic elections in Iraq. And... Uh, I stayed there till mid late 2008, a little more than three and a half years. And I know that because I'd gotten injured uh, during a rocket mortar attack on the embassy. And uh, I injured my neck really bad. And uh, my knee didn't really realize how bad it was. So I got home, and they wouldn't let me go back. So that was, that was the end of that. Hello. I would like you to tell us a little bit of how Bando impacted your life and why uh, did you decide to like focus on Bando because I know that you practice other martial arts and I would like to know why Bando uh, above the other ones. You know, how I got into Bando and, and uh, my father 
introduced me to martial arts. He was a black belt in judo, which he earned in Japan, uh, Japanese masters. Uh, he brought that back to the United States when, uh, when I was born. He started kind of coaching me a little bit uh, on protocols and uh, subject matter with judos and throws and, and you know, uh, that was my first introduction, which I really enjoyed. Uh, in the early 70s, I got involved in Gojiru Karate. And Gojiru is first uh, karate in the world, but it was started uh, from Fuchao, China, and brought to Okinawa. And from Okinawa, it spread and became karate. Uh, before that, it was called Empty Hand. Kara means emptiness. Te means hand. So, uh, before I got the name of Gojiru or Shotokan or Shidoru or any of the martial arts out of, out of uh, Japan, and they were named after the hand of the city that they that they trained in. Whether it was Naha or Shuri, or Naha Te, the hand of Naha or the hand of Shuri. Uh, some of the best Bondo Grand Masters, including Dr. G himself, trained in the Goju Root Karate systems in Japan and in Okinawa. And they United States and passed that knowledge on to a lot of people uh, in the 50s. And uh, Goju Root has a strong foundation throughout the world today, and Mexico especially. So when in the, the late 80s, early 90s, I was... Uh, getting my first black belt, and uh, I had trained earlier, but I had you know, gotten involved in other sports such as weight training and, and uh, police work, and it kind of took me out of the uh, martial arts world for a few years. Uh, in my early 30s, I, I picked it back up and started training again, and I got my black belt in Gojiru, but I wanted to go further than that. Uh, so I had to go to see my teacher's teacher, who was uh, now a Bondo Grandmaster and a Gojiru Grandmaster, uh, Chet Buffington. And uh, Chet Buffington had stopped practicing Gojiru because a lot of the guys in that area of Willing, West Virginia, and Steubenville, um, they had been from the University of College where Dr. G had eventually ended up as a professor there. And they were introduced to Dr. G and, and introduced to Bondo. And all the group guys kind of brought their students along with them. And uh, it, it took them a few years to get me to cross over, but eventually I was drafted, <laughs> if you will, into the Bondo system. And I've been in Bondo ever since, some 30 years now. Uh, would you say that Bando um, help you develop more, uh, or help you in some way? Uh, your yeah, I mean, uh, you know, learning any martial arts, martial arts is like any other athletic sport. Uh, there's a lot of people that play baseball or football or soccer. There's a lot of people who practice martial arts, but there's different skill levels throughout martial arts, just like there's different skill levels in, in football. Um, being a black belt in, in a martial arts, I, I equate to being, uh, say, a starter on a football team in high school. Uh, there's a lot of guys who are good high school players that never make it to college, but they're just not that good. And then there's a lot of guys that do go to college, and maybe that's your second degree, maybe that's your third degree. And... Uh, then there's the higher levels, uh, like professional football. So, of all the practitioners in the world that train martial arts, less than 3% of those practitioners ever make it to black belt. So, to make it to the next level, which is the second and third degrees, less than 1% of that 3% ever make it. So, um, it's a lifelong journey. It's something that it's, it's not a hobby. It, it, to, to get to that level, you have to make it a lifestyle. And uh, I've practiced it and lived by it my whole life. And it's, it's helped me get through some rough times, mentally, physically, emotionally. 
Um, so, yeah, that's how I introduced the bond there, was through Goji. Okay, um, I'm trying to remember some of the stuff that we discussed yesterday, so let me let me remember. Um, I remember that you said something something very interesting about how when you are in a, when you were in Iraq, I believe, you said something like of the hundred percent of the people that are there, only ten percent are the ones that are like uh, fighting, and the other ninety percent are the ones that help those ten percent to. There are gangs, butterfly gangs, and they're called one percenters. And what that means is one percent of all the people who ride motorcycles are bad boys, uh, members of biker gang, uh, like the Hells Angels, and some of the others. Same thing with terrorists and uh, and freedom fighters. One man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. So. Anyone fighting against the United States or the coalition forces, by many are deemed fighting for the victims of their religion and their land. But the population, only about one percent of that population, are causing a hundred percent problems. Uh, one well-trained fighter or terrorist can cause the destruction, madness, and mayhem. To make it look like the whole country's involved. So, uh, there may be several hundred known violent extremists, and they may have several hundred more in the, the background that they're developing uh, to fight in their jihad, which is their holy war. Uh, but the vast majority of people are just good, hard working uh, people who want to raise their families. Uh, an interpreter his entire life dream was to own a car. He worked in the Middle East, uh, you know, but not a new car, you know, a $300, you know, didn't have any turn on the top of the car. That was his dream. So uh, we take things for granted in America and mm -hmm. another. Well, also, I'm I'm really trying to to under, to remember some of the things that we discussed yesterday because I I was so amazed about everything you said. <laughs> so right now I would like you to talk a little bit of Dr. G. Tell us a little bit of the, of him and who is him for you. Well, you know I first met Dr. G of course through Chet Covington and uh, I had been a Goju Room practitioner. Uh, Dr. G had also been a Goju Room practitioner and had trained with Gogan Yamaguchi in Japan. So he was a big lover of karate. He, he had trained in India and in the Far East. He had trained in, uh, in Burma. And there were many, many Bondo practitioners and Muay Thai practitioners in Burma, which is called Lithway, and in Thailand it's called Muay Thai. Uh, after having met Dr. G, Uh, I was introduced to him again by Grandmaster Chet Buffington and uh, a friend of mine named Mark Simmonson, who's also a high master Siaji and a kickboxing champion, uh, started bringing me in to train with Dr. G's high, highest student. And uh, I learned more training with Dr. G in, say, three years, I learned in probably a decade. A training coach because the knowledge wasn't there. Dr. G's knowledge of martial arts, I mean, he's a martial arts genius. Uh, his skill set and his ability to teach and perform and the photographic memory that he possesses to retain all this knowledge is, is beyond belief. Okay, so I remember that yesterday you said something about Dr. G being something like the Grandmaster of the Grandmasters. Some people would, like, confuse about it. Can you tell us uh, why would you say something like that? I mean, again, it goes back to professional athletes. Um, the percentage of guys that, that become pro athletes, whether it be in soccer or football, it's, uh, it's a very, very low percentage. Same thing with MMA fighters. You know, it's uh, the 
there aren't uh, 150 pro fighters fighting in the top 10 of each weight class, you know, in the MMA, there might be thousands trained, but to actually get into the octagon on a international and world class level is, is few and far between. And of those, not many make it. So, uh, Dr. G would be considered, uh, as history will report at some point in time, the best of the best. Uh, he admired Dogan Yamaguchi, the cat, the way I admire him. Uh, Dr. G's ability and knowledge and expertise far exceeds that of anybody we've ever watched on television. Uh, a lot of people talk about Bruce Lee, and Bruce Lee was a great practitioner, but his teacher, the IP man, or if not, was um, far beyond Bruce Lee's talent. And because he didn't sell himself to magazines and movies, people didn't know who he was. And there's martial arts practitioners in little corners of the world that are better than anyone you've ever seen or ever will see. But they're not interested in self-promotion. Uh, they train and they just have unique abilities uh, like, like few of us do. And I'm considered a pretty good martial artist in my area. Uh, one of the things that Chet used to say is, uh, you know, good compared to you. Well, compared to some of the local guys, I'm the, the best they've ever seen. But the problem is, they haven't seen anything far. Guys, <laughs> right, so, right. I like G. That's, that's the top of, you know, that's Mount Everest for a martial artist being, being an issue. I just said, uh, you said yesterday about Bando is not for sale. <laughs> a lot of people will never know who Dr. G is, uh, Imam G, uh, because he would never sell himself. Uh, Bando was never for sale. Uh, he was, uh, a lot of the knowledge was kept secret. Uh, the Kukri, for instance, was considered a secret part of the ancient system, and it wasn't to be shown in public. And uh, if you was to look back at some of the magazines that came out in the 70s, there were some local writers who practiced Shotokan and, uh, and were well-known in the sports fighting arena. Uh, you know, they were very good at what they did, which was point fighting, And, uh, you know, we actually have a world champion, Jokey Hill, who just lives the next town over from where we are. Uh, and he, he trained under Don Madden. And Don Madden has trained many, many great fighters. But, you know, John, Dr. G would say, you know, you're very good at what you do, but you do not do what we do. And what other practitioners do was they, they you know, they kick the legs Uh, the knees and elbows, um, we didn't use them in uh, tree sparring because they're so dangerous. Matter of fact, speaking of, of you know, MMA, elbows and knees, uh, I don't allow my students to use it. Uh, I teach it to my upper students. Uh, a local fighter just, you know, eight miles down the road here got his jaw broke, both sides of his jaw. I'll send you the photograph. Maybe you can put it in here. Sure. He caught a knee. Second in MMA fight, and he caught a knee in the jaw, and it crushed and separated his jaw right along here. Broke it completely in half on both sides. So, people have no idea what, you know, that is meant to be a very destructive. You know, it's not meant for sport karate, it's meant to crush, to kill, to maim, to spike. Same thing with the knees. And, uh, But when you start talking about knees and elbows, you can be injured permanently the rest of your life. Uh, you look at some of the greatest fighters in MMA today, um, Conor McGregor being the latest, fighting for another world title, and he shattered the shin bone. And he'll be like if he ever walks right again. Uh, but that can be a lot, and he can fight again if he's crazy enough to do it, but why? Uh, he's only made all his money, and, um, you know, his, his career's over. Like I said, uh, you know, a professional fighter's career is normally over by the time they're in their early to late 30s. And, 
And like I say, I mean, Dr. G will never be known like Bruce Lee was because he didn't allow himself to make movies. Uh, he didn't share a lot of the knowledge to the outside world. And uh, that's the reason why. Okay, well, um, I don't know if you, if there is something else you wanted to share, uh, this is the time. Uh, thank you so much for all your, all your knowledge. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. I really appreciate your time. And for those people who don't know you, uh, I know you as a, uh, a very good practitioner and teacher. And uh, you and Dr. Del Minor started Bondo Mexico. And, and we hope that you continue to grow and uh, train and enjoy the martial arts. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Well, and last question. Have you seen Aliens? Have I seen aliens? Uh, you know, a lot of people don't believe in aliens. I've seen some things, that, and uh, the military have uh, released some videos of, of some unidentified flying objects and submersible objects. And, uh, you know, the mil our military and, and the military in Britain, France, uh, the USSR, and Canada. Have also admitted that you know there's things flying around there that they don't know exactly what they are. Uh, so you know that's something that's yet to be explored. Uh, I've seen four things in my life that I don't know what they were. Uh, so uh, I I honestly don't believe we're alone in the universe. If that answers your question. Well, okay, Zayahi, thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, I hope we can talk very soon. Yes, sir. Thanks a lot. Goodbye. Thank you. Have a good night.